let me start let me start by sharing my screen so i hope it works it's sure yep. yes Okay, great. So thanks again for the introduction. And um, as you can see, just beforehand, just in case that I'm forgetting it at the end, uh, I would like to thank the Otto Münstedt Fund in Denmark for granting me the Otto Münstedt Guest Professorship for the last two years. The title, yes, Modeling Grain Growth in Thin Films. Of course, I will not be able to, you know, talk about everything. So I'm pretty sure in the end there will be open questions, but I will try to give you an overview of what is possible. So the structure of my talk, I will start with a short introduction and then come really to my model saying something about the basics and then more the application to the thin films with the specifics and then come to some applications. So introduction, I suppose I don't have to make this long. Most materials, yes, the properties depend in a polycrystalline material on the grain size. And only if we can understand what's going on and in the end really control the microstructure, we have a key to improve materials properties. And one of the problems that we usually have is thermally activated grain boundary migration. What does it mean? Well, in a polycrystalline material, all grains try to optimize, that is minimize basically the energy. If I have just one isolated grain, this means that the grain will shrink. So surface energy reduction. However, of course, while this seems to be quite easy, in reality, it's not. Because in reality, we have a polycrystal, so we have always some neighboring grains and not everybody can shrink as we have volume conservation on a global scale. And locally, well, locally we have an equilibrium at the grain boundaries. Let's make it simple. If all my boundaries have the same properties, same mobility, same energies, then I have three neighboring grains that share a triple line just as it, show, as it is shown here in the second image. And then I know if the properties are identical for all the boundaries, then I will have 120 degree angles between the boundary faces. Now, this sounds easy. However, if one of my grains is now starting to shrink, for example, then my neighboring grains have to adopt in order for volume conservation and the equilibrium at the junctions to stay like this. So it's really a complex 3D problem. And yes, this also applies to thin films. Whereas the problem, well, one of the problems is that quite often we have really brilliant experiments and we have a theory what, say, the experiment is showing us what is happening in reality and our theory tells us what we think is happening. And then there is quite often a gap between the experiment and the theory. And in order to bring it together, I'm really fond of using computer simulations because in simulations, you can really play around with your parameters to a much higher degree than it is usually possible in an experiment. And this may help us improve the theories on one hand and understand our experiments to a higher degree. And yes, this is valid, not just regarding the microstructure and its properties, but also regarding the structural changes as they may happen, not just during grain growth, also during, for example, recrystallization or Oswald ripening. So it can be quite complex. Why use mesoscopic uh, computer simulations and not, you know, atomistic ones? Well, like I said, we can use them on the microstructural level. And yes, they give us insights into fundamental physical processes. So we can really focus on individual boundaries, on individual grains, but also on the whole digital sample. And they give us also additional information on the morphology on particular grains or the topology of the whole microstructure in 3D. And like I said, 
often those simulations allow a far more precise manipulation of the materials parameters than I can do in an experiment. So I could, for example, take my simulation and try to find out if by manipulating one or two parameters, I can make the simulation actually fit to my experiment and then use it for further predictions. One of these basoscopic computer simulations is the Monte Carlo method. It is quite simple in its basics. So the first application in physics was in solid state physics for ferromagnetic materials. The magnetization was represented by spins in two states, up and down. So we had the classical Ising model, which is now nearly 100 years old. However, of course, you cannot use this to describe a fully crystalline material. But in the year 1952, POTS generalized the Ising model and allowed not in two states up and down, but generalized it to Q states. So technically speaking, we are always speaking about the Q states Ising model. But in order to honor POTS and his contributions and to make the stochastic influences clear, it's usually called Monte Carlo POTS model or short than just POTS model. Why is it so simple? Well, in its basics, it's simple because you have only two materials parameters. We have the grain boundary energy and the grain boundary mobility that enter our calculations. And we can assume, for example, that both of them depend on the local misorientation regarding certain grain boundaries. So we could calculate for each grain boundary from the crystallographic misorientations, the mobility and energy. But we could also obtain this information, for example, from an experiment and then put them into the simulation. Well, these are the only two parameters and then we can already start. Now, what we do is usually we take a polycrystalline grain microstructure, sometimes from the experiment, sometimes we obtain it digitally and map the microstructure onto a lattice. In 3D, quite often a cubic lattice is used and in 2D, a square lattice. The total number of lattice points, at least I'm always saying in 3D, take at least 250 in each direction and in 2D, take at least 2000 in each direction. Then your lattice is large enough so that you can put enough grains onto the lattice to get some real statistical results. Every lattice point has some nearest neighbors. And this can, of course, change. I really like taking in 3D, for example, the 26 nearest neighbors into account, meaning uh, if I have my lattice point, I'm not just taking the first nearest neighbors, which would be then like uh, left, right, up, down, in front and behind, but also then, you know, when you go further away in the corners, uh, those further lattice points into consideration. And yes, quite often we are using periodic boundary conditions meaning I don't have to treat the surfaces of my digital sample um, in any special way. But when you look closely at the image here on the right hand side and you pick one corner, can you see my mouse? Okay, then you see here a brownish grain. And you see the same grain in the lower left corner, in the lower right corner, in the upper right. So you will see it in every corner, the same grain. So this is perfect. I don't have to introduce anything for the surfaces. And it's also good for the analysis because then I don't have to make assumptions regarding surface grains for the analysis. And then we are nearly set up for a simulation. The only thing that I need because I want to do an analysis also later, I want to know something about grain sizes and temporal development. So I need to know what the size unit and the time unit is. The smallest size unit is actually one of our lattice points. It's called here a Monte Carlo unit and represents a cluster of atoms of a grain. So each lattice point that I have is not an atom of a grain and it's also not a grain. So it's something in between. So I need enough lattice points for each grain. 
in order to describe its morphology correctly. And then again, my total lattice should still contain enough grains for some physical meaningful simulation. The smallest time unit, well, quite clever name compared to the Monte Carlo unit is then a Monte Carlo step. And it consists of N so-called reorientation attempts. And N is nothing new. We've seen already N. N is the total number, number of lattice points that we have in our digital sample. There's only one question left. What is a reorientation attempt? So I want to do N within one time step. What is a reorientation attempt? A reorientation attempt basically treats one lattice point that I'm going to pick. So what do I do? Well, in the first step, I select one lattice point totally at random. It can be either within a grain or on a boundary. Now, of course, we are talking about grain boundary migration. So whenever I pick a lattice point that is fully enclosed by neighboring lattice points that have the same orientation, I can stop with this reorientation attempt right away because there is no boundary to move. Only if I'm on a boundary, I'm going to proceed with the next step. What is the next step? Well, I'm going to choose a new orientation and assign this new orientation on probation. Again, the argument, we want to see grain boundary migration. We don't want to see nucleation. So we are not going to take just any orientation, what, but an orientation that we see in the neighboring lattice points, only then we can have a moving boundary. Okay, if we have this, we can see here in the right part of the image, we have basically two states, the original one and the changed one. And the question is basically which one is better. So what we are going to do is we are going to calculate the energy for the two states. Well, it can be done a bit easier because generally you would take the Hamiltonian and then sum over the whole lattice and over the nearest neighbors for each lattice point. But as I just said, within one reorientation attempt, I'm just going to look at one lattice point. So the rest of my digital sample is not changing. So I can make it easy because what I need is some information on the difference in energy. So I can really make it much more simple and just sum up over the nearest neighbors. And here already the grain boundary energy enters for the first time my equation. I need to know for the grain boundary at which I am right now, what is the energy? And I need the information on the maximum grain boundary energy in my sample. So these two information are needed. And then I have the difference in energy, which can now be positive or negative. What does it mean? If it's negative, it basically means that I'm reducing the energy by the change in orientation. And if it's positive, I would have to put energy into my sample in order to force the grain boundary to move. Okay, then the decision is quite simple. We are selecting the final orientation based on the difference in energy. If it is negative, we accept it with a very high probability, which depends not only on the grain boundary energy, but also on the grain boundary mobility. And you can see this here on the left-hand side, it says high mobility. Okay, I'm going to accept it with a certain probability for a certain grain boundary. However, even if I have to put some energy into the system to change, I still may accept this change, but with a much lower probability, which can be seen here in the right-hand side of the first image. Now you see, I've put here next to it a second image, which says maximal mobility. It simply means that the right image contains something that I haven't talked about, because if we look here at the equation, there is still something beyond grain boundary mobility, energy, and difference in energy. It contains KBT. And KBT is called a simulation temperature. And yes, it is purely a simulation temperature. It doesn't have to do anything with real 
temperature that you would usually use to treat your sample in an experiment. It's just an experimental, now a simulation, sorry, parameter. So basically it's some kind of activation energy and it has to be selected very carefully because what we see on the right-hand side, if I set the simulation temperature to zero, it makes my simulation much more easy and faster. I'll totally give you that, but then I'm only going to accept the change in case I'm going to reduce the energy. Now you could say, but that's totally fine to me. It is, but it's not fine for the underlying lattice because you always have to remember there is an underlying lattice under our polycrystalline microstructure now. And if I set the simulation temperature to zero and make a real optimization, the simulation algorithm will always put my grain boundaries along the underlying lattice. So I will have lots of grain boundaries that align in a 3D cubic lattice, ver horizontally, vertically, and diagonally. So this is something that we totally do not want. So we really need the simulation temperature and we need something like this. However, in order to select it, this can't be said like, take this parameter. You need really to try it out. And if, if somebody is interested, we can totally talk about it later because it's a bit complicated on how to choose it in particular. But we really have to choose it. However, this is already the basic algorithm. There isn't more to it. And you have to repeat these four steps n times, basically for your whole microstructure lets once, and then you have one annealing time step. It's an energy optimization. Now, what can we apply it to? There's quite a large number of problems that I've used it for, of course, normal grain growth in order to check my simulation versus uh, theories. Uh, I've done it uh, for uh, junction controlled grain growth, uh, as you may uh, find it in nanocrystalline materials. I've modeled texture controlled grain growth, normal grain growth. Um, yes, also grain growth in uh, graphene, even though this is a bit more tricky. And then in recent years, more focusing on grain growth in thin films. Where's the catch for the thin films? Well, previously I mentioned that we're always treating our 3D samples as if there is an infinite continuity. Like I'm taking my digital sample and I can put it just next to it and you will not see any break. So I don't have to treat the surface in a specific way. However, if I'm now going to talk about thin films, we know that there are very distinct surfaces and we also know that these surfaces can have a strong effect, then, okay, I have to treat them separately. So in my simulations for thin films, I'm only keeping the, um, say, horizontal boundaries as periodic boundary conditions, like my microstructure continues there, and I'm going to take the top and the bottom surface and treat them differently, namely as free surfaces. Okay, when I do this for a 2D simulation, you can see here the first line gives my initial microstructure and then I'm going to start the simulation. Uh, this is just a 2D, basically a 2D a simulation, like I'm going to take a slice and then do the simulation and we can see that the microstructure is coarsening. We are getting less and less grains over time. And then finally, well, if I'm doing an analysis, I see that, yes, there is an initial period of time here on the left-hand side if I analyze the average grain area as a function of the milling time. This initial regime, growth regime, depends on the initial microstructure. And then I have a linear relation between average grain size and annealing time. And yes, this is totally not unexpected, um, totally fine. For long annealing times, we see some stagnation. So basically my grain boundaries align near perfectly to the two surfaces. And this can be also proven on the right-hand side. I've not taken the average area, but linear grain size. So basically measured the distance between grain boundaries 
at the top, this is the blue curve, and in the middle of the sample. And we see again, yes, there is an initial period of time, there is a linear increase and stagnation for long annealing times. So this looks quite nice. When we look at additional parameters such as a scaled size distribution. So I'm taking the linear grain sizes and divide them by the average linear grain size. I can get, for example, here the blue curve for the surface. And in the middle of the sample, the red curve, it seems to be a bit different when we are far from the two surfaces. And the question for me was, well, is this now because I'm doing a 2D simulation? Should I be going ahead with 2D or should I really go to 3D? So, okay, no way around. Let's go to 3D. And you can see here two samples again. Horizontally, I'm keeping my periodic boundary conditions and just treating the top and bottom surface as free surfaces where my grains can totally move free without any obstacles. But you know, the top doesn't mirror what's happening on the bottom. They do not know anything about one another. And what we see is indeed, we are going to get different growth loss, different topology, and a totally different causing behavior. So we really can't use the 2D simulation. But I'm not going into detail here because I wanna show it directly for some applications. Like I said, we can do normal grain growth also in the thin films. What does it mean? Basically, I'm going to assign for my grain boundaries the same properties. So all my grain boundaries have the same energies and the same mobilities. And the really great thing about the POPs model is that you don't have to ask me then what were these energies and mobilities. Because if you remember the uh, simulation algorithm, only the relative mobilities and energies enter the equation, meaning I don't have to know the absolute values because I'm going to divide for each boundary the energy by the maximum energy. And now if all boundaries have the same energy, this relative value is of course one. So this makes the simulation regarding normal grain growth really fast and really easy. Okay, and we see Apparently, the average grain area analyzed at the surface of my film is indeed increasing as a linear function of time, meaning my radius, average radius, would increase as a square root function, just as expected. And this was totally fine for me. However, when we go ahead and we analyze long annealing times, and that's why you, you see here a blank white area, and we go ahead, we see that apparently there is a point where the coarsening slows down dramatically. And the question is, why and where is this point? So again, this image average area versus time here on the left-hand side. And on the right-hand side, we can see the relative number of columnar grains. So meaning I'm checking for each grain, whether it is either within a fi the film or at the surface, or if it connects actually the two surfaces. And you can see that apparently during coarsening, the percentage of grains that are connecting to both surfaces is increasing until you get to a point where roughly 85% are columnar. And this is precisely the point where the coarsening slows down dramatically. And the reason is, Quite simple. If I go back, you can see here again these two images. And when you compare the left and the right hand side, well, what we see is that in the left hand side, we have quite a large number of grains, even if they are at one surface. You can see that they are curved much stronger. So they have a much higher curvature compared to these columnar grains on the right hand side. So basically, for the say first growth regime where we see this first linear increase, we have quite a large number of grains that are shaped more or less, say, um, as you would find them in 3D with a high curvature. And then when we come to long annealing times, we get this columnar structure with a reduced curvature and there with a reduced driving force for grain growth. 
So this is totally, when you think about it, not unexpected. And what we see is apparently, it's not like we are just reaching 100% columnar and then nothing has happened. We are seeing that no matter how long, and I can go ahead and do this for longer times. What we see is there are always some grains which are losing contact. Yes, in between, we do have 100% columnar, but then apparently some grains are losing the contact to one surface and starting to shrink and disappear. And that's why we still get further coarsening here also in the left image. And this was totally different in the 2D case. In the 2D case, we had just the grain boundaries aligned more or less perpendicular to the surfaces and there was no more driving force. That's why we saw stagnation there and no stagnation in the 3D case. And we can also check quite a large number of information. You can see it here when I plot the non-columnar grains in my microstructure. I can see there are always some non-columnar grains, even if in between there are nearly none, there are always new non-columnar grains showing up. The question is, did we force the simulation results due to the film thickness? And the answer is actually no. We see the same behavior. And this is done for different uh, film thicknesses, varying between a very thin one that I wouldn't use for further simulation, but also you can see for this very extremely thin film, it works. You can go to really thick films. I've also done it for um, more increased thickness. It works. It follows the same path initially. And then at some point, and this point really depends on the film thickness, the coarsening slows down and also for long annealing times, they all have the same slope. So there is something really intrinsically about it. This is not a forced result due to the film thickness. So normal grain brush seems to work. The question is, of course, we want to get more realistic. So what I picked uh, to show you is uh, triple junction controlled grain growth. Um, for those of you who are not that familiar with this topic, basically in nanocrystalline grain structures, besides the grain boundaries, also the triple lines and quadruple points gain importance. And the reason is when you go from, say, 100 micrometer to 100 nanometer in grain size, you will have a much higher degree of, say, atoms close to the triple lines compared to your whole sample volume then you have in the microliter sized sample. And this is why they may have really an important influence. And you can see that, for example, uh, this was an experiment on nanocrystalline iron. And you can see here that the average radius versus annealing time, we've just seen the average area versus annealing time, which was a linear function which means that the average radius versus annealing time for normal grain growth is a square root law of time, then we would expect here also a square root law. And we can see things for say long annealing times in the sense of for larger grain sizes. However, for the small grain sizes, there, there seems to be a linear correlation between the average radius and the annealing time and not a square root one. And you can show this also by analytic theories and computer simulations in 2D and 3D that this works. And even though there is no universal explanation, so I'm, I'm not going to take fully sides. Of course, if somebody comes up with a different explanation for the thermal stability of nanocrystalline materials undergoing grain growth, I'm, I'm going to adopt. But I think finite mobilities of the triple and quadruple junctions can be used quite nicely to explain what we see. And I'm not going to go into detail regarding the theory. Let's just say you can derive theoretically three different average growth laws. Too fast. Uh, to ever, uh, three average growth laws. The first one is the one that we already saw. If the grain boundaries control your coarsening, you will always get a square root law in time. If your triple junctions control your microstructural coarsening, then you will have a relation between the average radius and linear in time. 
And of course, if it's the quadruple junctions, you even get an exponential relation. The question is, I've shown this a couple of years ago to work nicely in 3D and in 2D, but does it also work in thin films? And the question is, where do I put this information in the simulation? So what I said here is basically finite mobilities of the junctions. Okay, let's focus on the triple junctions and say, I wanna implement finite mobilities in my simulation. Then we are going to have a look at the simulation algorithm. And we see here our uh, one annealing time step. When we look at the bottom of the slide, we see repeat n times. This was our n reorientation attempts and the four steps. And there's only one place where we can implement it because a reduced mobility, well, we have the mobility right here. So what we are doing now is we are not going to say, okay, all my boundaries, including the triple lines have a specific mobility, but I'm going to give all boundaries one mobility and all triple lines, a separate mobility, a much lower mobility. And when we do this, let's see what's going to happen. This is a simulation just for one triple junction in order to give you an idea. So I pick one large grain in uh, magenta and then a green one and a blue one. And if we start with normal grain growth, grain boundary control, we see that these 120 degree angles actually work out quite nicely. However, if I'm going to reduce now the mobility of my triple junction from left to right, we see that apparently the junction angles are changing. And the question is what consequence does this in the end have for my total microstructure? So let's start the 3D simulation in the thin film, including the separate mobilities for the junctions. And on the first look, I would say, okay, it's going to course, right? It looks as if, yeah, there is coarsening. Some grains vanish quite fast, others uh, are growing, but over time looks nice. But has something changed? In order to check this, I put here on the left hand side grain growth again under grain boundary control. So giving both the grain boundary faces and the triple lines the same mobility. And we've seen this before. Initially, quite a strong increase in average grain size. And then there is this change and then a much slower increase in grain size. However, when we go now here to the right-hand side, if I implement separate mobilities and take lower values for the mobilities, we see that apparently this first regime that was previously linear between average grain size and annealing time, we see here apparently that it's curved upwards. So if I would plot instead here the radius, we would actually see that the average radius is a linear function of annealing time, just as predicted theoretically. And for long annealing times, we get then the back to the square root law in time. So it's really working out. And of course, once you have the simulation and once it's working, you can always check more parameters. Oh, sorry. More parameters? Well, I picked here just one. Like I said, you could go and check, for example, the topology saying the number of faces versus grain size or the average number of faces of the neighboring grains regarding uh, the check up versus the number of faces of a particular grain. So you could go ahead, but just looking at the scaled grain size distribution, again, on the left-hand side, we have grain boundary control, so normal grain growth. And on the right-hand side, we see that apparently it makes a difference. This first regime, if I go back one slide, we see here this first increase where the average area increases quadratic versus annealing time gives us here in the image in the middle um, quite a 
different grain size distribution compared to long annealing times and compared to normal grain growth. And interestingly, long annealing times, well, it really seems as if we are back at the point where we were for normal grain growth. So apparently for larger grain sizes, we do have normal grain growth, but as long as my grains are small enough, we see a different kind of coarsening. However, there is much more that you could do. For example, you could go to real texture control. And you see again that, well, the average grain area, in this case, um, left-hand side is normal grain growth, right-hand side is texture controlled grain growth. And yes, we do have, say, a similar behavior regarding the average grain size passed in the beginning. And after some time, it really slows down. However, in this case, for example, I picked apparently a texture where we are getting a completely different size distribution. Now you may say, okay, but in any case, what we see for long annealing times, there is always coarsening, no stagnation there. And the question is, why? Or could we still observe stagnation? And this is something that I've done during my uh, Otto Münster guest professorship at DTU. We've started to look at the surfaces. Previously, I said, okay, we are going to treat the surfaces, the top and the bottom surface as free surfaces, meaning I'm allowing this grain boundary here between yellow and green to move completely free, putting there no obstacles and not forcing anything in particular. The only thing that is changing compared to 3D is now my neighborhood. I do not have further lattice points above the surface. And of course, due to this, the energy calculation is slightly different. Now, what we've been thinking of is, can we in the POTS model actually introduce physical grain boundary groups? This hasn't really been done before, so we were curious and curious about can we put them? I mean, of course we can put them there, but what is the result? And do we have to pick a certain size for them, a certain um, topology, a certain morphology? We were not sure. So we picked two quite simple examples. We said, okay, in the first step, you can see on the left-hand side what we've used until now. And then we said, okay, let's just take the two neighboring lattice points at this boundary away and say, okay, these two lattice points that you can see here in white just belong basically to, to the air, to our uh, whatever is around our digital sample. It's no longer part of our sample. And in the second case, okay, let's make our groove larger. And then we've started the simulations. Like I said, we are not going to change in the horizontal direction, just at the surfaces. And of course, once we add a groove, again, the energy calculation is going to change slightly. What is the effect? Well, simulation in 3D, and I'm just showing you here the surface with physical grooves. And we've plotted the grooves here in black in order to uh, visualize it a bit better. And as it is so small, we've increased the size of this small uh, area that is marked here in white here at the bottom. And what we see is that most boundaries are not moving. They are staying where they are. However, in few cases, when you look at the lower right-hand side, you can see that there is some magenta gray that is apparently growing quite fast into the neighboring green one. And it's not just the magenta one, also from above the lilac and the blue one, they are all growing into this. So apparently the green one is probably a very small surface grain that was already small here and it is vanishing. And we can observe a second effect because afterwards we see the boundaries of these particular boundaries down here in the lower right-hand side are not really moving further. However, we have this 
hey, what to call this color, yellowish gray, that is really moving into our surface. It wasn't there before, but apparently there's a grain underneath which is actually growing to the surface, making contact to the surface, and then it's growing. But again, in this case, what we see in the last image here is it's really growing till it hits the grooves and then it stops. Of course, for this simulation, we just introduced the grooves once and we said, okay, you're not going to move. We are not going to change shape or anything because we were really wanted to check the influence of the grooves at this point. So we are not going to add further grooves and we are not going to make them change yet. This can be done surely in the future, but until now, we just wanted to check the effect, the pure effect of the grooves. But yes, when we do the analysis, we see this was without the grooves. The average area we always saw in our samples at the surface is increasing as a linear function of time and also within the sample. However, within the sample, it's increasing slower. And we can see this here in the right-hand image. Here I've plotted for different annealing time steps, the average area as a function of the location within the film. And you can see initially my digital microstructure is basically from a 3D sample. So there are no real size differences that we can see. However, as soon as the simulation sets in, we can see that at the surface, the average area increases faster than in the middle of the sample. So we are getting some kind of bathtub shape. However, this is not going to stay forever. This is just in this first growth regime for long annealing times this is going to go away again. But we are seeing some, some very distinct behavior. And we were now curious, what do these graphs look like when we pick a random annealing time step here in the left-hand side and add some grooves? Okay, in black, without grooves, and then we added the grooves. And we see immediately, ooh, my grain size is increasing. Can this be? And the answer is quite simple. When I add the grooves, I'm going to take away at the surface really tiny grains, very low number, but they are there, tiny grains right at the triple points, basically, which are due to adding the grooves vanishing. So it goes up slightly in the beginning, but this doesn't change the rest of the simulation because what we see is then, oh yes, if I add grooves, apparently, my average size increases much slower. And we can see this also when we have a closer look at the second image regarding average grain size versus location within the film. And we can observe more than one thing actually, because when we look first, say in this region between, sorry, roughly 10 and 40, lettuce plays. We see that in the middle of our film, there isn't much going on. It coarsens, and it coarsens just in a way that it had been coarsening without the grooves. So the, the center of the film doesn't know what's happening at the surface. However, if we go to the surface, we see that apparently the coarsening is slowing down dramatically. And yes, we can go ahead and we've done more analysis. And yes, I am going uh, to change more, uh, show more on this next week at the Grain Growth Conference. Let me just say, of course, it depends at the point where you add the grooves, what happens then and what happens for long in the times. But it is quite interesting that putting grooves in there can, in the end, actually lead to a stagnation of coarsening. We can show this. So all in all, I really like simulations and in particular, these kind of mesoscopic computer simulations as they may close our gap in understanding between what's happening in experiments and what we think we have to put in the theories. And yes, the POTS model is of course just one possible method. There are more. But I think it's 
quite simple in its basics. So it's also something that beginners can handle quite nicely. However, you have to be careful with the specifics, especially regarding the parameter selection. And then once you get the hang of it, it can get extremely complex. You can even go to uh, things um, as I'm going to see here on the right hand side in your uh, list of names, uh, Werner Skotsky. You can even simulate also in 3D samples where you have not just one thin film, but when you do accumulative roll bonding, you may have different layers. And then you can, of course, go ahead and treat the different layers differently, treat the interaction of the layers. You can make it really complex. And yes, there is a broad variety of uses for grain growth also in thin films. Like I said, normal grain growth is for me always the, the test case regarding the analytic theories. But of course, you can go ahead, take triple junctions into account, take surface effects into account. And if you are interested in further reading, just let me know if you have a specific problem where you may want to get some, some additional information. And with this, I would like to thank you for your kind attention. And I'm totally open for questions. And if somebody has a question later, just let me know. I'm keeping here my email address, my new one, uh, that you may contact me also later regarding any questions that you have. Thank you. Thank you, Dana, for a very inspiring, comprehensive lecture. Very nice overview also. Um, I'm going to uh, stop the recording now. Stop. The